Paulo Samoes from Sao Paulo in Brazil to give us an overview of the SDO mission uh, over the last 10 years and what we've learned on short-term solar, solar variability. So I'll hand it over to Paulo, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Dean and Georgios and everyone too for inviting me to give this chat for you. And um, so uh, I'm a flare person, so I'll focus on flares here. So we'll see what some of the things that we, we learned and discovered and confirmed maybe uh, over these past 10 years looking at flares specifically with SDO. So one thing I wanted to highlight here first is how SDO kind of became the, the instrument that came multi-wavelength analysis here for us, right? So for anyone here who does uh, flares, right, you get your instrument of choice and then you look, oh, we have a nice flare here. Let's look and then you ask yourself, oh, do you have Residate or Hinode or Iris or Nobiyama? You ask your colleagues, but you never have to ask if you have SDO data because it's there. Right? As Ryan mentioned, the, the high cadence of the instruments you pretty much guaranteed with some exceptions here and there that you you'd see you have some nice data from the the three instruments in sdo uh, so sdo saw everything in a way again virtually anything uh, that happened on the sun in the past uh, 10 years so i went to uh, uh, ads and with a, gave a quick search and multi wavelengths and filtered by the typical solar keywords and you see here the number of papers and then, of course, you do have some multi-wavelength stuff happening here, the pre-SEO era, because you have Soho and Trace and uh, Hinode already uh, going. But uh, when we have SDO happening, then there's a spike there and then it's plateaus at some high level of papers, because you always have SDO, you always have a nice AA uh, picture to show in your paper. From that, we learned a lot. We discover new things, we confirm so a few things, and, and other interesting questions appeared in during this time. So I'll highlight some of these. Uh, I cannot possibly go through everything we, we saw this in 10 years. So I apologize that I don't highlight your particular uh, paper here because there are so many. So first of all, I like to highlight magnetic implosions. I, I think um, Brian mentioned in a last session about these paper by Hugh Hudson in 2000, very short paper, three pages, just saying, okay, what if, if uh, things happening as the way we think, so the magnet energy is converted to other kinds of energy at the core of the active region and flare happens, so there will be a reduction of the magnetic pressure inside the active region, so the outer loops should collapse. And he called this the magnetic implosion. And with even with trace back then, Liu, Hui, uh, and others saw saw this effect. And uh, then when SDO came along, then a lot of things started happening. And this I highlight here from uh, Zudong Sun paper, on the famous February 15 flare. When you look at the uh, uh, this transversal cuts here through some loops and so look at them in time, you'll see that they shorten and weird things might happen or not, but it does this uh, uh, contraction of the loops. And many papers then started looking at these things everywhere. And I highlight here, there was also a discussion in terms of, do you see this because you have an eruption? So magnetic field was essentially wrapped, at, uh, sorry, uh, uh, eats away from the, the core of region or just the flare energy happens. So in this uh, highlight here, Jun Tao Wang's paper in 2018, that he, he does find some examples when you have a flare, see the contraction of loops without an eruption happening. Just show this how it works. This is one of the many, many examples you see the loops contracting at the flare, as the flare goes and they, they cut through this direction, you see the uh, contraction here in heights of many, many loops in this uh, region. And then when you look at the, see this is the, the tracing out that location for one of the many collapsing loops. And you take the, taking the derivative of this 
uh, I do it shouldn't differentiate data. He will complain about this, I know. But you see that this change of the rates of the con contraction matches the impulsive phase of this particular flare. So there, there's, there's something interesting happening there. We're still learning about this, about this effect. And this was essentially, again, SDO and AIA specifically showing uh, this, this effect it can be quite common. Still on the corona, uh, then we have magnetic reconnection. And I think probably everyone seen this movie from a young Sue paper. Uh, when you see the, the, the theoretical cusp of the act region here forming and then contracting and other things happening. So using uh, AIA and other in RESI specifically here, we see the, the, the high temperature and the uh, non-thermal emission at the top of this loop. Uh, uh, those, there, are, there are hints of the, uh, let's say, canonical reconnection um, cusp and uh, the, all the, those ideas that came from theory uh, from the past. And this is one example. There are plenty more of these. And from with AIA, we start to see these things happening. As Ryan briefly mentioned, with EIT back then, with, with a cadence of 11, 12 minutes, you'd be lucky to get a, uh, to see a flare. Now we can trace the evolution of the magnet field, which is highly dynamic, and you have all these things happening. Here's another example that I find quite interesting. That's again on the left here, you see the movie, or the reconnection, the loops uh, uh, join there and the cusp forms and taking a cut vertical here through this uh, uh, image. Then looking at the AIA 131 and 94, brightening there, you see that this, the, there's a hot region that forms is always goes up as Again, kind of expect from the um, reconnection ideas. And at, at given any given location, it cools down to 94 angstrom temperatures and eventually vanishes. It cools down uh, uh, completely out of the passing band. But then this, for those two, you see that the, the height is always increasing. Uh, for so you always have the reconnection at higher and higher uh, uh, heights there for the loops, and for this particular uh, flare is interesting. It's a very slow happening flare. This movie is like a, maybe a five, four or five hours of reconnection. It's very slow, very weak in a sense flare, but you, we do see these dark streaks. It look like the the, the sads, right? This uh, super arcade downflows. So it's looks like there's something that as the, the, the loops reconnect, something is collapsing down as other things go up. So again, lots of things that we can kind of confirm from theory, from uh, the, the expect from magnetic reconnection, but the other interesting things start to appear that we don't quite have an answer to that. So energy in the flare goes as happens in the corona, things go down to the, the chromosphere and lower corona and other interesting things happening. And I'll highlight, I want to highlight this, the idea of the hot ribbons and by hot I mean 10,000, uh, 10 million uh, Kelvin uh, and above. And uh, I think that the, back in the days of Yoko and, and uh, X, uh, SXT observations, there are a few papers that highlighted there are some foot points up, uh, appearing in the impulsive phase of flares in soft X-rays uh, with a quite impulsive uh, time profile. So there are, uh, I mentioned here, there are some of the papers that highlight this with some specific flares or uh, a statistical analysis. And that was quite quiet for many years, <clears throat> excuse me. Then there's uh, this paper by uh, Lindsay Fletcher that they look at the uh, specific flare here, particular flare, and look at the ribbons uh, with the con black contours here, and take the 131 emission uh, from, from loops and, and ribbons uh, in separate ways, and you see that the, uh, the 131 matches the profile of the ghost with this, the dark curve here, and 131 kind of all the different bits <laughs> of the, the flare 
compose the whole the overall uh, uh, high temperature emission. But the interesting thing is the blue curve here, which is the northern ribbons. So those ribbons here, they pretty much give off most of the uh, uh, high temperature emission. So it's quite low down. And that's something that we never expected to see. The, again, back from the uh, soft X-ray uh, Yoko, we saw that, but no one really kind of thought, oh, what's the implication for that in terms of the usual flare model that we think? Uh, that's not the only example. There are quite a few more now using EVE, the paper by um, Michael Kennedy <clears throat> back in uh, 2013. Uh, Ryan also has some paper, has a paper in 2012 that highlights some same uh, similar stuff. Uh, that looking at the EVE lines, a whole bunch of EVE lines to, to uh, do some DEM analysis. In this case, I can't quite remember which of the many, many techniques. Uh, Marchan highlighted quite a few in his opening talk a few weeks past. So essentially, for those who are not used to this uh, particular uh, technique, you use different uh, uh, observations that cover a wide range of temperatures to constrain what would be the thermal distribution of the plasma. And that's pretty much what you see this figure here on the right. So the distribution of the plasma uh, uh, in the, uh, during the flare is not isothermal. We know that. So there's a weird distribution here, temperature with quite a lot of stuff happening above 10 million here. And then comparing the AIA, that's 304 images. So Typically, low down the chromosphere, see the ribbons, and look at the AIA 94, which should be around eight, six, eight million Kelvin ish. And take the, the uh, I can remember now the contours, I think as 50 and 70%, if I'm not mistaken. Those are the contours here that match the locations again of the ribbons. So, again, lots of hot plasma low down and the, uh, near the chromosphere. We don't know exactly how high that is, but it's not in the loops yet. So this is during impulsive phase. And another quick example using the same idea or same technique of the DM analysis, but pixel by pixel in the AIA images. So this is a very unusual looking flare. You see this, the AIA 94 and 131, uh, time goes from the top to bottom. Uh, the ribbons are on, the left and right here, and the loops connecting the ribbons. So you see the flare right from above. And doing that pixel by pixel DM analysis, see the temperature ranges here from two to three million, eight, well, let's say seven and 10 and 12 or 13 or something. And as the flare starts to develop here, the, uh, the redder stuff basically showing where there's more plasma here, uh, they start to appear at the ribbons at temperatures from a six to seven up to maybe even uh, say 13 or 14 million Kelvin at the ribbons. Later on, of course, the flare develops and the loops get quite dense. And, and then you see the most emission coming from the loops as we always expected. But at the beginning of the impulsive phase, hot stuff appears at the bottom. And we don't really have a good explanation for that yet. Uh, very, very rec recently, Hugh went to, uh, 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 we start chatting and Hugh come to realize that when you look at the goals uh, uh, temperature, the, the goals derived, the temperature derived from the two channels from goals, always at the beginning of the flares, the, the, the temperature is already above 10 million. So right, something like 10 or 15 uh, million Kelvin, uh, fairly uncertain. There's quite a noise there because the signal is quite weak. But then this is interesting. Okay, what's happening there? And then looking at the AA images at those times, we see similar stuff. See at the very beginning, this is uh, the contours from 1700. So you see chromospheric source appearing. So there are a few dots there. And at 131, the brighter stuff matches those locations. We start to see loops, yes, but the brighter stuff is always on, on, on 
compact sources that matches the chromospheric emission. So even at the very onset of the flares, there was already some uh, hot material very low down in the atmosphere. Again, if it's low corona or top of the chromosphere or transition region, who knows? But um, so Q highlight here is a few, there are four events in this case, there are a few others. So again, another open question here for us to debate. <laughs> So, so that's from specific cases. So again, so we have 10 or now 11 years of data. So it's a good time to do statistics, statistical analysis, which most of us know is a lot of work for just one paper. No one wants to do that because uh, you know, we need the papers and that's, but that's important. Statistical analysis are important because we start, we stop looking at just this particular case or that particular case, we start to have a more general view of very, very different situations there. So there are many, I mean, there should be more, I think, and I'm, I'm at the fault of that as well. But I highlight here three uh, papers in, the, in different aspects. So uh, Thomas Mrozak uh, very recently put out a paper on uh, the, well, a catalog at first on failed eruptions. So they are using uh, some uh, 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 clever algorithms to highlight different uh, aspects, so different events. So to have a eruption or a failed eruption or flare or confined flare and so on. So the first result there is just a whole bunch of, let's see, 12,000 failed eruptions. And I know they're working on the follow-up on that. So there's new stuff coming. Uh, Karin Desor also have a paper on the on dimmings. I think this was mentioned when uh, a few weeks back. So just look in the AIA uh, in Eve, just to highlight to detect when the dimmings happen. We have a coronal uh, mass ejection, and some part of the the corona goes dark, and so they. Uh, finally, and if someone put numbers to those, we see those, but how much, what's the area, what's the volume, what's the the, uh, the impact of those uh, dimmings on the corona. And uh, also a paper by Masha that was mentioned quite a few times already uh, on a very interesting paper uh, and says number one, so I can't wait for, for the sequel for this paper. So and I, uh, looking at many, many, many flare ribbons and the magnetic uh, aspects that I know she'll talk about this. I want to highlight this particular figure here because we finally have some idea of the, uh, the, the ribbon areas, uh, stati statistically speaking, in terms of the, the ghost flux, which basically makes sense because uh, if the ghost flux is strong, that means a large volume of plasma that uh, in the corona so that they should connect down to a very large area of ribbons. But the spread is interesting. The linear in log space is interesting, but the spread is quite interesting here. So there's a lot of stuff here that we can use and learn. Uh, still on statistical analysis, I'll highlight three more now specifically about white light flares. So now we're looking at HMI stuff. I uh, think everyone knows here that we've pretty much been using the pseudo continuum that we get from uh, the line fitting from the, the six uh, wavelengths from HMI to look at white light because unfortunately we still don't have a proper instrument to look at the optical continuum. It's one of the probably the not the biggest but certainly the oldest mystery in terms of flares. The first flare was observed in white light and we still don't quite know what's happening there. So uh, Kuhar here, look at the correlation of the X-ray flux in energy, all the parameters you can derive from RACI and X-rays and white light stuff from HMI. And again, we see something that we expect, it's of course is one of the many results in the paper, that ooh, there's a nice correlation of the flux and we see in the optical uh, continuum and the energy deposited and the, from the high energy electrons. And again, the spread is interesting. Why do you have so much difference and not a kind of a very straightforward linear 
relationship there. So there's open questions there again. Song and Tian, uh, a, couple, a few years back, uh, did also an analysis specifically about circular ribbon flares. And again, I highlight here, this is interesting because the contrast of the white light emission as a function of ghost flux, so kind of a power, general power of the flux. And it's pretty much flat all across the board with a few uh, 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 outliers there. I mean, the, flux, the flare is quite strong, so above the X class. So it's quite interesting to know why to have this difference here. And there are some interesting outliers there as well. And the third one here is Castellano Zuran and Lucia Kleint, very recent flare, uh, flare paper, uh, looking at the relationship of white light emission and the photospheric changes. Again, the photospheric changes I'll leave for a different conversation, but the amount of observational information on white light as excess, number of pixels, how many, uh, the brightness of the pixels, things that we don't really had until then, un uh, until now, now they, they can be used to, to dig a little deeper in terms of what's the, the physics that is happening there. So we now have some very strong uh, observational constraints. Again, there's quite a spread that is interesting in terms of the excess and the actual intensity of this happening and this, the sizes. So we, we're still collecting observational information about white light uh, that has been pretty scarce over the decades now. Still on white light, I think this was quite mentioned before, but I think it's interesting because it goes from the, the, the origin of white light. The physics is a photospheric emission from the black warming, uh, uh, back warming of black body in the photosphere is chromospheric from hydrogen recombination in the chromosphere there. So we have the papers by Juan Carlos in 2012 showing that the height formation of the white light and X-rays are more or less the same about to the inside the photosphere, let's say below 500 kilometers. It's one flare, it's interesting. And then a few years later, uh, Sam Crooker and, uh, and collaborators show three flares that the height formation now is about 900 kilometers, so in the chromosphere. What's happening? We don't know. So again, an open question that needs a good answer. So since I, I wasn't going to mention this, but since that came up before, and uh, I think it was last uh, session during the breakout rooms, or chatting about white light flares. Uh, so there's a discussion of the physics. Uh, so I'll just highlight Graham Kerr is working on a paper, a simulation paper. So again, there are caveats for that, we know. Uh, using radding that if you calculate everything, the, uh, so if you have the contribution function was essentially the emission as a function of height. In the pre-flare, everything as we expect comes from the photosphere. As the flare happens, hydrogen uh, is ionized in the chromosphere and recombines and you see this excess of emission and very, uh, very large uh, wavelength range here from essentially from the Baumol continuum down to, I can't remember which, after passion. Uh, now, everything there is related to hydrogen recombination mostly. And that excess is optically thin. So this is the tau equals one layer is in the photosphere as we expect, but this excess is optically thin. And uh, in a very general way, just comparing ranges, the data points of observed ranges, this is not data fitting, right? Comparing to the spectrum uh, or the spectra we get from different models, the order of magnitude seems right. Uh, so there's, a, again, Graham could discuss a little, a lot more about this, but I want to highlight this point because that maybe that we're getting there via models and then we have data to, uh, at least from HMI, one data point in the spectrum, but uh, maybe you can start to, uh, match this, uh, uh, close down this question. But two minutes left there, Paolo. Okay, so almost there, thank you. So uh, on comparing modeling data, and then now we have uh, uh, AIA has been very useful to, well, to, to compare with, people are getting 3D modeling now, because 1D modeling we talk about quite a lot. Matt Carlson gave a talk about this, when they have like three models, uh, 3D, 3D models, 
Uh, Mark Chan, Graham Kerr, and Jeffrey presented their very recent papers and essentially uh, using AIA as a benchmark to compare and see if their models are doing more or less the right thing that we expect. So again, AIA being quite useful to provide constraints for our modeling eff eff efforts. Uh, on Eve, almost closing, so I'm to highlight the observation of the Lyman continuum on Eve. Uh, Ryan was the one that bring, uh, brought this up back in, back in 2012 and 14. And Marcos Machado got, uh, got in touch with him to work on something that he worked 40 years before, uh, looking at exactly the Lyman continuum. And then they invited me to tag along with this work. And I want to highlight this because it was quite quite a nice effort here to see how the uh, the color temperature of the continuum relates to the actual electron temperature of the region of the when the climate continues to be formed. And uh, make this the, the, the long story short, it could be that uh, after the emission there comes uh, from the quiet sun, non LT uh, scenario going to an LT scenario during flares which is quite interesting, but there are some other caveats that might relate to a high, uh, a layer above that's uh, the formation region that's optically thin that needs more uh, studying. And last thing, we're still learning about SEO data. So from uh, Mikhail Svanda presented a paper on the HMI pseudo continuum showing that we have to be careful that the HMI photometry that we use so the, the fitting of the line sometimes doesn't quite work well and we might reading our photometry wrong. So we have to be aware of that and very careful. Uh, Phil Chamberlain, I think this was mentioned in previous talks, uh, point out that you have to be careful when looking at the Doppler uh, measurements on Eve if using max A, max B apparently is fine. So be careful. And from AIA for the UV channel 16, uh, 16 and 1700. Uh, I was quite curious a few years back. Was is it what is really inside those very wide filters? Right? We know for the UV filters uh, compared with the Chianti data and uh, uh, models and so on. So uh, I uh, figured out a way to dig up old Skylab data for uh, very very high resolution spectrum from a flare and a plage, and then comparing all the lines and continuum, the silicon continuum we have here, we estimated that when you see a flare in 1600, we're looking at not only carbon four, but carbon one lines and many, many, many other lines. You can see these are not noise, this is not noise, that's data, that's not lines. And 1700, you pretty much have also chromospheric lines, helium two, carbon one, alum aluminum two, and many, many, many other lines. Uh, not any, no hints of continuum on 1700 on the flares. Everything else is continuum from the photosphere. So uh, yeah, we learn is still on that. It's one flare using Skylab data. So have to be careful. Uh, so to close up, uh, just to remind you that out of, you know this, STO is always watching. That's been quite helpful. We came up uh, where, so everyone is doing their multi-wavelength analysis pretty much due to STO is being there. Uh, it's been also quite useful as a context and support data for other instruments on so Alma, Iris, Hinode, and so many, many, many others. The, that brought us a lot of data, a lot of this, uh, new information, confirmation of old ideas and open questions. We have also good results in terms of statistics. We still need more, I think. And to close up, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for the SDO instrument teams for keeping those running up and providing the data for us to play around with. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, I was starting to see if there was any questions in the, in the chat there, Georgios. There is only one question by Valentina Zarkova. Yep. Uh, nice talk, Paolo. You have not mentioned a radiative uh, hydrodynamic model, Hydro 2 Gen, Druet et al. 2017, okay. Nature Communications, um, and Druet et Zarkova 2018, Astronomy and Astrophysics explained rather well some H alpha emission and white light emission in flares. They even explained the heights of white light emission measured on the limb by Kruger et al. with a rather high accuracy. 
maybe it will be useful to add to your review. And I, I just, yeah, I stand corrected. I, that's absolutely correct. I apologize, Valencina. You're absolutely right. I apologize. That's the only question or comment that I see so far. But okay, of course, thank I you. Go on. Sorry. Uh, unless, sorry, did you have one yourself? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> well, thank you again for that, Paolo, for a nice summary of of the last ten years. Um, so I think we would need to move on or run a little. But behind, if you want to stop sharing your screen.